morning. From John chapter 10, we left off last Sunday at verse 11, where it says in verse 11, Jesus speaking, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, he sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I am known by his own, and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Therefore my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. And therefore there was a division among, again among the Jews because of these sayings. And many of them said, well, he has a demon and is mad. Why do you listen to him? Others said, Well, these are not the words of one who has a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? And Lord, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for uh, these verses. And Lord, there's been a lot of uh, just kind of hiccups today with our service, with technology and everything. We just ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would rule and reign over our time together. Lord, we ask that your Spirit would teach us We ask that your spirit would open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to your word. I pray and ask that your Holy Spirit would be upon me to teach your word. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, we started John chapter 10 last Sunday. And John chapter 10 is such a wonderfully rich chapter. Uh, And in John chapter 10, Jesus declares that he is the good shepherd. And he contrasts himself with the religious leaders of Judaism, the priests and the scribes. And the religious leaders were also known as shepherds, or the shepherds of Israel in the scriptures. Uh, But they are false shepherds. In fact, in John chapter 10, Jesus refers to them as thieves, robbers, strangers, and hirelings, or or hired hands, who don't really care about the sheep. Uh, Back in chapter 9, at the end of the chapter, Jesus said that they were blind. They're blind shepherds. And so he distinguishes here in this chapter the, the false shepherds of Israel from himself. He's the good shepherd. He's the true shepherd of Israel. He's the shepherd that is spoken of in Ezekiel 34 that we looked at last week. The good shepherd that God would send to gather God's flock to himself. Uh, And I want to go back to that prophecy in Ezekiel 34 and look at it once again because it, it is the context of John chapter 10. It's the backdrop for John chapter 10. So turn back to Ezekiel 34 for me. Ezekiel 34. And here again in Ezekiel 34, the Lord indicts the religious leaders of Israel, the the shepherds of Israel. In verse 1, Ezekiel 34, verse 1, And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel, the leaders. Prophesy and say to them, Thus says the the Lord God to the shepherds, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. The weak you have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who were sick, nor bound up the broken, nor brought back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost, but with force and cruelty you have 
ruled them. Again, he's talking about the religious leaders of Judaism. And he says here of the religious leaders of Judaism, you know, again, these are, these are hirelings. Uh, they're hired hands in a sense. Uh, they feed themselves. They don't feed the sheep. They don't care for the sheep. They don't care for the people of Israel. They care only for themselves and no one else. They're only seeking their own and not the well-being of, of the people that they're supposed to be serving. Uh, in Luke chapter 20, you can just, just stay in Ezekiel, but listen to this. Jesus says, Beware of the scribes who desire to go around in long robes. They love greetings in the marketplaces, the best seats in the synagogues, and the best places at feasts, who devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. Jesus said, you know, the, the scribes, the religious leaders, they, they like, you know, to go around in long robes. They like to just look good to the people. You know, they like greetings in the marketplace. They love it when they're at Wegmans and someone, oh, Rabbi, Rabbi, you know. <laughs> You're buying mushrooms too, me too, you know. They love that. They love those celebrity kind of thing. The best seats in the synagogue, the best places at feast, this, you know, the table, the head table, seat of honor. At the same time, they're devouring widows' houses. They're, they're, they're using the sheep and manipulating the sheep and uh, intimidating the sheep. Taking advantage of them for their own benefit, for their own personal gain. Again, in Ezekiel 34, verse 5, he goes on, the Lord speaking, So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. Remember when Jesus saw the people, the crowds, he was moved with compassion because they were like sheep without, shep without a shepherd. They had the religious leaders were supposed to be the shepherds, but they were like sheep without a shepherd. And they became food for all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered, verse 6, through all the mountains on every high hill. They had no one leading them. Yes, my flock was scattered over the whole face of the earth. You strike the sheep, you strike the shepherd, the sheep scattered. No one was seeking or searching for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, says the Lord God, Surely because my flock became a prey and my flock became food for every beast of the field, because there was no shepherd, nor did my shepherd search for my flock, but the shepherds just fed themselves and did not feed my flock. Therefore, O shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Verse 10, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand, and I will cause them to cease feeding the sheep, and the shepherds shall feed themselves no more. For I will deliver my flock from their mouths that they may no longer be food for them. He says in verse 10, the shepherds will cease being shepherds over Israel. They will uh, feed the flock no more. Uh, and of course, in 70 AD, the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed and the Levitical priesthood ceased to exist. And God removed the shepherds took them away. Verse, verse 10 was fulfilled. Now look at verse 11. For thus says the Lord God, Indeed, I myself, the Lord God speaking here, Indeed, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. And here we have a picture of the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd. God Himself, the Good Shepherd of the sheep, will search for His sheep and this is written in Hebrew, and in the Hebrew, what it says here, it's very emphatic. I myself, the owner of the sheep. The priests were just hirelings, hired hands. But God, the great shepherd who owns the sheep, will search for his sheep that belong to him, that are his. As a shepherd seeks out his flock on the day he is among his scattered sheep, so will I seek out my sheep and deliver them from all the places where they were scattered on a cloudy and dark day. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries, and I will bring them to their own land. I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, in the valleys, and in the inhabited places of the country. Verse 14, I will feed them in a good pasture, 
and their folds shall be on the high mountains of Israel. There they shall lie down in a good fold and feed in rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. What does Psalm 23 say? The Lord is my shepherd. And what does it say? He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Look at verse 15. I will feed my flock and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek what was lost and bring back what was driven away. I'll bind up the broken and strengthen what was sick. But I will destroy the fat and the strong and feed them in judgment. Now skip down to verse 22. Therefore, I will save my flock and they shall no longer be a prey. I will judge between sheep and sheep. I will establish, notice, one shepherd over them and he shall feed them. My servant David, he shall feed them and be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David, a prince among them, I, the Lord, have spoken. Now, Ezekiel writes this after David lived. This is after the time of David, so he's not talking about David, King David. He's talking about the son of David, Jesus Christ. God will, will, will rescue his sheep. The good shepherd will come and save his sheep and call his sheep and they will come to him and he will gather his sheep that are his own and he will be the one shepherd over them, the good shepherd. In John chapter 10, if you want to turn back there, in John chapter 10, Jesus is explaining now that he's the good shepherd that was promised in Ezekiel 34. He's the one that God spoke of through the prophet Ezekiel. And back in John chapter 10, look at verse 11. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And then he repeats it a second time. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. So Jesus is the good shepherd. And let's dis dissect that a little bit. What does that mean that he's the good shepherd? Well, well, let me say first of all that this is an I am statement that Jesus makes. I am the good shepherd. This is his second I am statement in John chapter 10. If you look back in verse 7, he said, I am the door of the sheep. Here now in verse 11, I am the good shepherd. So this is one of his seven I am statements. This is the fourth I am statement in the Gospel of John. And, and the way that this is constructed, what Jesus says here, the way that this is constructed in the Greek the emphasis is, listen, I am the shepherd, the good one. That's the order in the Greek. I am the shepherd, the good one. In contrast to all the bad ones you've had before me, I'm the good one. I'm the good one. You know, that's why we look to Jesus to shepherd us, because he's the good shepherd. He's the good one. We look to Him to lead us and protect us and provide for us. We, we don't look to people to shepherd us. We don't look to institutions or government to shepherd us. We look to Jesus, the Good Shepherd. When we come alongside someone to, to help them or counsel them in whatever they're going through, we point them to the Good Shepherd. We point them past ourselves and any, any answers or thoughts or ideas we may have and we point them to Jesus. We point them to the Good Shepherd. Jesus is, you know, Jesus is called the Wonderful Counselor in the book of Isaiah. He's called the Prince of Peace, the Source of Peace. And so we point them to the Good Shepherd. And look at verse 11 again when he says, I am the Good Shepherd. The word good here, if you're a note taker, this word good, it, it means good in a moral sense, like morally good, but it means more than that. The word good also means beautiful, excellent, attractive, handsome, lovely in every way, on all levels. See, everything about Jesus is beautiful. He's the excellent shepherd. He's altogether lovely, says in the Song of Solomon. He's altogether lovely. He's desirable in every way. 
No one compares to him. He is the shepherd above all shepherds. He's the good one. The preeminent one. The preeminent shepherd. Above all shepherds. Now, how, how many of you here, by a show of hands, how many of you know that personally? How many of you here can say, I know that Jesus is the good shepherd? Because I've experienced his goodness, right? Amen is right. He's the good shepherd. And look at verse 11 one more time. The shepherd, the good one, he demonstrates his goodness. He demonstrates his excellence as a shepherd by dying for his sheep. By dying for his sheep. Verse 11 again, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Jesus will say this four times in this chapter. That he gives his life for the sheep. Now, shepherding, uh, shepherding sounds like a lot of fun. You know, you're, you're outside, right, all day, and, you know, beautiful scenery. You know, there's, there's solitude, there's tranquility. You don't have to talk to anybody. You know, there's, there's, no, there's, no, uh, there's no desk. There's no phone. There's no emails you have to return. There's no reports to write. There's no deadlines. There's no boss. There's no coworkers. Did I mention you don't have to talk to anybody? <laughs> Where are my introverts here, right? Doesn't that sound wonderful? Right? You come home from work, your wife says, How was your day? Great. I didn't talk to anybody all day long. Anything interesting happen? No, I just sat outside all day. Doesn't that sound great? Sounds wonderful. <laughs> but, uh, shepherding sounds fun, but it's actually hard work. And in ancient Israel, it was, it was dangerous work. You know, thieves and robbers would try to steal your sheep. And we saw that last week in the first ten verses. In fact, in verse ten, Jesus said that the thief wants to steal, kill, or slaughter, and destroy the, thie the, the sheep. So a shepherd in ancient Israel uh, may face a situation where he has to fight off thieves to defend his flock. And besides thieves, there were wild beasts that would attack a flock of sheep uh, in ancient Israel. There were wolves and bears and, and lions. Uh, and a shepherd had to contend with wild animals. Attacking his flock. Uh, last night I did a little reading and, and just, you know, this is free information. Uh, in the United States, each year, there are 230,000 sheep that are killed by wild animals. Uh, so it's, still, it's still a big, big deal uh, with, with shepherds having to defend their sheep. In ancient Israel, there were wild beasts. Uh, and listen to this, 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 34. Listen to what David says about being a shepherd. 1 Samuel 17, 34. David talks about taking care of his father's sheep. And this is what he says. He says, and when a lion or a bear came. And you could stop right there. If you were writing this, if you were David, right, what would you say next? And I ran, right, for my life. I, and I guess the lion ate all the sheep. I don't know. I never went back. But David says, And when a lion or bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went after it and struck it and rescued the sheep from its mouth. Whoa. But wait, he's not done. And when it turned on me, I caught it by the beard and I killed it. What? <laughs> So first of all, you know, uh, this apparently happened more than once while David was watching his father's sheep. Because David didn't say, there was this one time, I'll never forget it for the rest of my life. A lion came. Right? I remember once when I was about 10 years old, I lived in Florida, uh, and I had a, a family member who lived down the road a little bit from us, down this, this dirt road that we lived on. Uh, and their house was on a bayou. And I remember I was in their backyard and I was fishing and they had this little cement 
platform right on the edge of the water and I was sitting in a lawn chair and I had my feet dangling in the water and holding my fishing pole and as I'm sitting there an alligator popped its head up right at my feet and I jumped up and I started running it was 10 years, 10 years old uh, this, just, just last April, just a month ago I was down in Florida with my family I was back at that house with my brother-in-law and we walked down by the water and don't you know I was looking for that alligator? <laughs> 40 years I got my kids and they don't get too close to the water there's alligators here, right? you know? I never forgot it <clears throat> David here, it seems for him this is something that happened on more than one occasion when a lion or a bear snatched one of the lambs out of the flock and David says when it happened he went after it he didn't run the other way he ran after it and he rescued the lamb and then when the lion or the bear turned on him and attacked him he says he grabbed it by the beard and he killed it with his bare hands killed a lion killed the bear that's pretty intense Shepherding was dangerous work, serious business. The shepherd risked his life for the sheep. And Isaiah 31, it talks about when a lion comes around you know, the, the town, around the village, the people of the village call the shepherds to go fight the lion. You got a lion hanging around the town, get the shepherds out there. Why the shepherds? Because that's what they do. Shepherds kill lions. So they sent the shepherds. The shepherds, they will lay down their life to protect the sheep. It's just what shepherds do. And verse 11 says, the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. And again, four times Jesus will say this in John chapter 10. He gives his life or he lays down his life for his sheep. That word for there that he uses in verse 11. For the sheep. It's the Greek word pair, And it means in place of. Or on behalf of. Or instead of his sheep. Jesus Christ died on our behalf. In our place. Instead of us. So that we don't have to die for our sins. This is what is called substitutionary atonement. Jesus uh, Jesus' death was a substitutionary death. He laid down his life on our behalf. He died for his sheep. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 uses that same word when it says, He who knew no sin became sin for us. Who pair? He became sin for us. It's the same Greek word. He became sin on our behalf. For us. Instead of us. In our place condemned he stood, as the hymn says. Isaiah 53 verse 8 says, For the transgressions of my people he was struck down. For the transgressions of my people he was struck down. Substitutionary atonement. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep because that's what shepherds do. Now, from a... From a uh, uh, a practical, um, natural standpoint, if the shepherd is killed fighting off thieves or killed fighting a lion, well, the, then the sheep are left without protection. Then the sheep are vulnerable. If the shepherd dies, the sheep are dead, right? From a, just a practical standpoint. But our shepherd... He's no ordinary shepherd. He's the good shepherd. He's the good one. He's the most excellent shepherd. And our shepherd laid down his life for the sake of the sheep. And look down in verse 18. In verse 18 it says he has the power to take it up again. You see, our shepherd laid down his life, but then he took it up again. The good shepherd was crucified and killed for us, for his sheep. But then on the third day... He came out of the grave. On the third day, he was resurrected. And after he was resurrected, what did he do? The good shepherd began to call his flock back to himself. And the good shepherd has been calling his flock to himself all the way up to this day. Amen. Calling us by name. Out of the world. Bringing us into 
his fold, into his flock. Now the good shepherd is contrasted here with the hired hand in verse 12, the hireling, or the hired hand. The hireling is someone who was hired to watch someone else's sheep. Again, Jesus is referring to the religious leaders here of Judaism. He's, he, he refers to them as hirelings. They're not shepherds, they're hirelings. Verse 12, but a hireling, a hired hand, who is not the shepherd, is not the one, He's one who does not own the sheep. He sees the wolf coming and he leaves the sheep and he flees and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. In this illustration, uh, what does the wolf represent? It, it represents anything that comes to destroy the sheep of God. Whatever it is, anything that comes to destroy the sheep of God. Verse 13, the hireling flees because he is a hireling. And he doesn't care about the sheep. For the hireling, it's just a job. The sheep don't belong to him. They aren't his sheep. He doesn't care about the sheep. He doesn't love the sheep. He, does, he, he just cares for himself. He's only in it for personal gain. So when, when danger comes, when a wolf comes or some other wild beast or a thief, he's not going to risk his life. He's not going to risk his life for sheep that aren't his. He abandons the sheep and he flees to preserve his own life. And this is the big difference between the good shepherd and the hireling. The good shepherd sacrifices himself to save the sheep. The hireling sacrifices the sheep to save himself. Jesus says his religious leaders are just hirelings. Look at verse 14. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I am known by my own. The good shepherd, he, he knows his sheep, and he's known by his sheep. In other words, the good shepherd has a relationship with his sheep, and it's a relationship of love. The good shepherd loves his sheep. That's why he died for his sheep, because he loves them. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That's why the Father gave His Son. That's why the Son gave His life, because He loves His sheep. Again, in stark contrast to the hireling. The hireling has no love for the sheep that they shepherd. They have no affection, no concern, no compassion. We saw that in chapter 9, the way that the religious leaders treated the man that was born blind, who was miraculously healed and received sight for the first time. What did the religious leaders do with him? They kicked him out. Kicked him out of Judaism. There's no love there. There's no compassion. There's no relationship. Verse 16. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Remember Ezekiel 34 talked about the one shepherd. We talked about verse 16 last week. The, the other sheep Jesus refers to in verse 16 are the Gentiles, the non-Jews. We saw last week in verses 1 to 10 that Jesus is calling uh, sheep out of Judaism. And here in verse 16, we see he's also calling Gentiles out of the world. He's calling them out by name to follow him. This is this, these other sheep that he refers to. Probably most of us here are Gentiles, non-Jews, and he called you by name. And what, did he, and what does it say in the first part of John 10? He led them out. He led us out of the world that we were in and the stuff we were in. He called us out of the world to follow him. And he became our shepherd. And this is what Jesus is doing. He's, he's calling his sheep out of Judaism, he's calling his sheep among the Gentiles, out of the world, to himself. You know, in Ephesians it says, before Christ called us, we were without God, in the world, and without hope. That's our testimony. We were without God, in the world, and without hope. And then Jesus, our good shepherd, came and found his lost sheep scattered all over the world. 
and he called us by name and he led us out and into his flock. And Jesus says he's making one flock with one shepherd and that one flock is the church made of believing Jews and believing Gentiles. And when I say the church, I don't mean a building. I mean the people, right? The sheep, the people are the church, not any building. He's making, he's making one flock out of the two. He's making the church. In Ephesians 2, it says Jesus reconciles both Jews and Gentiles to God through the cross. And he brings the good news of peace with God to Gentiles who were far away from God and peace to Jews who were near to God. And he's bringing us together into one flock with one shepherd, Jesus Christ, the son of David. Therefore, now watch verses 17 and 18. Therefore, my father loves me. Why does, why does the father love him? Because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. Now look what it says. This command I have received from my father. The father commanded the son to lay down his life and take it up again. He says he, had, he has the power to do that. And the father commanded the son to lay down his life and take it up again. And the son voluntarily obeyed the father. And so the father loves the son. Why? Because the son obeyed. Because the son was obedient. And in this, of course, it wasn't an easy command for Jesus to obey. At Gethsemane, remember, he's crying out. He's sweating drops of blood. He says, Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. If there's any other way, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Jesus voluntarily obeyed the Father's command to lay down his life and take it up again. Even though it was difficult and hard for Jesus to do, he was obedient. And so the Father loves him because of his obedience Jesus demonstrated his love for the Father by obeying the Father. And what does Jesus say to us, his disciples? If you love me, what? Keep my commands. If you love me, keep my commandments. We affirm our love for Jesus by keeping his commands. Just as Jesus affirmed his love for the Father by keeping his commands. Finally, verse 19, therefore, there was a division among the Jews, the religious leaders, because of these sayings. And many of them said, well, he has a demon and he's mad. He's insane. Why do you listen to him? Uh, others were a little bit more rational, reasonable, and said, well, these are not the words of one who has a demon. And a demon opened the eyes of the blind. And so there's this division. And some said, well, he has, he has a demon. Others said, well, he, he can't have a demon. A demon wouldn't do this stuff. And so they have this division. They're debating of whether is, is Jesus demon-possessed or not demon-possessed. And you had one camp that said he was demon-possessed. You had another camp that said, no, he's, he's not, not demon-possessed. But neither of them said he's Lord. Neither group said he's Lord. Today, you've got people that debate Jesus. He was a rabbi. He was a teacher. He was a prophet. But listen... Unless you say Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, it does no good what else you say about him, right? Both of these groups here that are divided over who Jesus is, they're, they're both going to die in their sins. The only way that you can be forgiven of your sins is by calling upon Jesus as your Lord and Savior, coming to that conclusion about him. So Jesus is the good shepherd. He's the shepherd. He's the good one. He's the beautiful one. And what makes Jesus the good shepherd? Well, first of all, he laid down his life for a sheep. But he didn't stay down. He got back up on the third day. He was resurrected from the dead. Second, he loves his sheep. And he enjoys a close relationship with his, with his sheep. And third, he's calling his sheep to himself. And he's uniting us together into one fold called the church with one shepherd, Jesus himself. He's the good shepherd, and there's no other shepherd like Jesus. There's no other shepherd like him. Lord, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for these verses. We thank you, Lord, that you're the good shepherd. We thank you that you came and you laid down your life for your sheep. We 
thank you, Lord, that you have called us out of the world and you've led us out of our life of sin and bondage and darkness. And you've led us to follow you, Lord. We thank you that you are a good shepherd leading us, guiding us, providing for us and protecting us. Lord, Lord there truly is no other shepherd like you. You're perfect in all of your ways, Lord. And we thank you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. And melt me, mold